this is this is the oldest church that we have in our union of churches in in, in, in Namibia, and uh, we must never forget that. I was uh, I'm so thankful to stand here again this morning, remembering the happy years that I've spent here. Um, Uwe, was it the eighties, early eighties? The right um, honourable the Gouveia was there. <laughs> and uh, a few others that are no longer with us were there. And uh, yeah, it was the first church. This, the back, this, this church was the first church that I ever belonged to. I was converted in 1978 at UCT um, under the ministry of uh, Frank Retief, um, who of course you know, was urging us to, uh, to become part of the Church of England. And then God saved me truly and sent me to the Baptists. <laughs> it was, um, that was just a joke, by the way. Um, but I do, I do want to give thanks to, to the Lord this morning, public thanks to the Lord for the uh, opportunity to stand here once again after so many years. And uh, it really moves my heart, brothers and sisters. Uh, this is also, incidentally, my last year, God willing, in the ministry at Eastside Baptist Church. We've served there for 34 years now, and Marcel and I, and, uh, and we're looking uh, forward to God's guidance and leadership. And so what we want to do, we want to ask you, please, if you can remember us in your prayers um, as we look forward to the future. We're not thinking of retiring. That's not a word that I see anywhere in the Bible. Uh, we want to, however, be useful. And so... Um, Please do remember us, and as God gives you ability to, to pray and uh, to remember us, we would really love to um, be remembered by you. Greetings then from the Eastside Baptist Church, only right that we said great, send greetings uh, from our congregation to yours. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. Which brings us to the word of the Lord, which comes this morning to us from Jeremiah chapter 33. I'd love to read the the chapter with you, though we will only look at the first three verses. And I remind you while you're turning there that that, uh, that, um, old um, preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who had such a profound impact upon my own ministry in the 90s, uh, said that the Word of God was God's uh, uh, way and means to heal us of the mumps and the measles of the soul. Isn't that lovely? God's word is given to us as, uh, as uh, the balm of Gilead. Um, and as he so quaintly said, the doctor who was a physician himself, um, uh, apart from a pre- being a great preacher and an influential preacher, uh, it's God's cure for the mumps and the measles of the soul. And may God direct his word in the way that he alone knows how to direct it. You know, you, we're sitting here in a congregation that has got very varied needs and the Holy Spirit is present and he knows how to minister to each one of us personally. And this is the joy that I have when I present the Word of God to you. Will you please then in your Bibles, or do we have it on the overhead as well? If you don't have your Bibles this morning, please look with me at the overhead and there will be the record of God's written word. Before we do that, let's pray. Father in heaven, once again we are uh, very mindful uh, that we cannot be in the hands of men or man. God have mercy if that were the case. Help us to understand and to realize that on a day like this which is appointed uh, as as a day of worship, Uh, we should not be found in the hands of men or of man, but that we should be found in the hands of God, our Heavenly Father. And we ask you that you would direct our attention, that you would arrest our hearts, that you would give us an experiential understanding and union um, of Christ's work for us, even through this Old Testament text. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So follow with me then in your Bibles. And this comes to you at the beginning of the year. This is the third week, um, third Sunday uh, in January. I want to share with you some prayerful thoughts for the beginning of this year. The word of the Lord 
came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the God. Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of the city and the houses of the kings of Judah that were torn down to make a defense against the siege mounts and against the sword. They are coming in to fight against the Chaldeans and to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I shall strike down in my anger and my wrath. For I have hidden my face from the city because of all their evil. Behold, I will bring it to health and healing, and I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of prosperity and security. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all the guilt of the sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of the sin and rebellion against me. And this city shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and a glory before all the nations of the earth who shall hear of all the good that I do for them. They shall fear and tremble because of all the good and all the prosperity I provide for it. Thus says the Lord, in this place of which you say there's a waste without man or beast, in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man or inhabitant or beast, there shall be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land, as of first says the Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, in this place that is waste, Without man or beast, and in all of its cities, there shall again be habitations of shepherds resting their flocks. In the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the Shephelah, and in the cities of the Negev, in the land of Benjamin, the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, flocks shall again pass under the hands of the one who counts them, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise that I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day, and my covenant with the night, so that day and night will not come at the appointed time, then also my covenant with David my servant may be broken, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. And my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David my servant and the Levitical priests who minister to me. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you not observed that these people are saying, The Lord has rejected the two clans that he chose. Thus they have despised my people, so that they are no longer a nation in, in their sight. Thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob, for I will restore their fortunes, and I will have mercy on them. This is the word of the Lord according to the prophet Jeremiah. This is the word of the Lord that goes out to the Walthersburg Baptist Church, for his word stands firmly um, entrenched until Jesus comes again. Prayerful thoughts for the beginning of a new year. And of course, you will um, immediately remember the text, um, which you will probably remember. If anything, if you will remember anything about the prophet Jeremiah, you will have quoted either to yourself or you would have heard this text quoted, Call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and hidden things which you have not known. I'm sure that you have heard that text. Maybe somebody's quoted that to you. You needed a bit of encouragement and somebody said, but God um, will yet bless you and will yet um, minister to you great and hidden things that you have not known. Well, as we look at this text, I think we need to just stop for a moment and remind ourselves of the context. Um, I've jumped right into the middle of a, a deep and profound prophecy here and, uh, and I, I, I need to say something about the background. Again, this chapter needs to be seen against the preceding chapters. That's kind of logical. The story is as follows. Um, Israel... And now by God's design is designed to go into Babylonian exile. Um, she will go into Babylonian exile at around 586 before Christ, 586 years before Christ. And uh, she's going to go into exile because God's had it up to here. God's patience does run out. And uh, so he has determined that the nation will go into exile. Now remember that this has happened before. The northern kingdom, which was separated um, about 150 years earlier, went into exile under the Assyrians um, and they were gone. The southern kingdom, which was rooted in Jerusalem, uh, was going to experience the same fate because of persistent spiritual waywardness. She will fall into the hands of the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar in time. But, and aren't you so glad you sang that song just a moment ago, His mercy is more. The Lord will have mercy on His people. He will, he will, he will bring them back in time. He will bring them back in time and He will restore their land to them um, roughly about 70 years after having been in exile, just enough to, for the memory of the old generation to have passed away thoroughly, you will bring them back under men like Jeremiah, I mean uh, Nehemiah and Ezra. Under these type of men, he brings them back, and of course Daniel prophesies in that period, and he will restore the land. They must go into exile, but he will restore their land. And Jeremiah knows all this. Because he is the prophet of the Lord. He's the true prophet. And with prophetic vision and with prophetic in insight, he encourages his people not to stubbornly resist. He says, people, go into exile. Do this. Go. Go into exile. You'll be safer there than you will be here. And um, the current king, who is Zedekiah, uh, sees him as subversive and as a traitor and so he has him put into custody and that explains to you the opening statement of this text the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the God you will have to go back to chapter 32 if you've got your Bibles with you you will see this very clearly he, Jeremiah was put into custody and uh, this is where we find him as we come to the 33rd chapter. And he comes now to us with a word of prophetic encouragement. He's speaking about the future restoration of Jerusalem, the city of God. And may I just say to you, this is a very helpful way of reading the Bible, is that the Old Testament uh, uh, is always a picture of 
the future. So when you think of Jerusalem, don't think of just Jerusalem. Think of her as a picture of um, God's chosen city, uh, God's people, um, God's ultimate people. Think of her as the church, a representation of the church. And you will see, of course, the city of Jerusalem at the end, right at the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, coming down from heaven. Um, the bride of the Lamb. The people of God. So keep in mind always that the, the, the Old Testament uh, is much bigger than what it appears at face value. Yes, he's talking about a real situation. He's talking about a historical situation. Yes, but it always points forward to greater realities. This is the, this is the prophetic nature of the Word of God. And therefore, immediately we come to the relevance um, of this prophetic book for us. So Jeremiah was a true prophet in the midst of a sea of false prophets as we have in our day. Man, how we struggle against false prophets who speak peace, peace into people's souls where there is no peace. Those are words from Jeremiah himself, by the way. And Jeremiah, like so many faithful people like, like you and I, I suppose, disturbed by the waywardness and the faithlessness and the behavior of a nation's political and spiritual leaders. Yes, it's true. We can never separate what happens in the country. The church and the state are separate entities, but we can never separate them in any nation. As goes the church, so goes the country. And, the, and as goes the country, so it has an impact upon the church. And so... Jeremiah is born into a time when he sees political and spiritual leaders living chaotically. Their, their lives of the leaders mirror what goes on uh, in society at large. There's a saying what's in the scripture. People uh, like priests, like people. The pulpit very much affects what goes on in the pew. We are not, we do not live in isolation, my dear friends. We are affected, we are deeply affected by what goes on around us. And so, as Christians, we see history repeating itself. So when we look at um, a prophecy like Jeremiah's, we kind of say, well, you know, that sounds kind of strangely familiar. Uh, we, we, we can see that happening. And we, and, and, and we see history repeating itself. We, we, we suffer also the consequences of being in the hands of rulers that have no regard for God, um, who, see, who seek solutions for our troubled societies, and our, and our society is troubled, who, who seek solutions for our troubled society in every sphere but from the Word of God. And because of this, there is a steady regression in our society. Things are not going forwards, they're going backwards. That's what Jeremiah was saying to his people. In Afrikaans, he's saying, Jelle boer achter eight. You're farming backwards. That's the transliteration into English. We're farming backwards. We, we're not making progress. And, uh, and, and there's a steady regression in society. Now, Jeremiah prophesied at a long ministry he prophesied in the reigns of three kings. Um, you can see that in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 1. There's King Josiah. He was actually a good king. He was a king who led a reformation. That just shows you how quickly um, knots can be untied. Because he, he was followed uh, by, by his two sons. And, uh, and uh, the one was Jehoiakim. And the other one was Zedekiah. Zedekiah is the one who actually locked Jeremiah up in, in prison. And we see from Josiah, even though he was a king who led reformation, that the, the, the um, generation that came after him did not hold on to the same principles as Josiah did. And again, the reformation came through the word of the Lord that came to Josiah. Reformation always comes when the word of God is boldly proclaimed and boldly accepted. But from Josiah onwards, Jehoiakim and Zedekiah um, 
uh, give no regard to the word of the Lord. And uh, so from Josiah to Zedekiah, the declaration is remarkable. Every generation, I want to remind you, and this, this is where the word of God speaks to us this morning. Every generation, that means you, yes you, even you young people, little girls over here sitting here. Even you need to know that you got to hold on tightly to the Word of God. If it doesn't get maintained by you, we will go backwards. And so it is. And we're living in a fairly backward uh, time as far as uh, the effect of God's Word uh, is concerned. Every, every generation needs to fight for reformation uh, because... Uh, life in a fallen world always pulls us down. Nothing gets better by itself. Everything needs maintenance. Even this pulpit, that, uh, this beautiful pulpit here, you know, it's going to, with time, it's going to not going to get better. You're going to have to maintain it. Everything, this building. Oh, don't we know in Walfus Bay how we need to maintain stuff. Um, that's the second law of thermodynamics. Things tend towards a state of disorder. Things don't get better. If you don't maintain, if you don't reform, if you don't go back to first principles, I remind you that life in a fallen world always pulls us down. And it is only the Word of God that pulls us up. And that's why we need Sundays like this. We need days like this where we are reminded, where we, where we take distance from the week in which we were battered and bruised, uh, and pull down and we need to conform our, our souls and our hearts again to the, to the word of the Lord like Jeremiah we need to hold on to the word of the Lord against all the odds and there are many odds stacked against us we, we need to continue to, to, to hear the word of the Lord as Jeremiah did did you hear how many times the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah again and again and again and again even in this chapter alone you need to have the word of the Lord coming to you, my brother and my sister. It needs to come to you. And it mustn't just come to you in that fashion. It must come into you. It must come into your hearts. It must embrace you. It must reform you. It must renew your thinking. Because the word of God alone gives us hope in a hopeless world. We need to hope against all. All odds sometimes because here there was no hope at least at the physical or at the visual level Israel needed to know that there would come a time when it wouldn't be like this what they were experiencing right now that there would be a time that they would come out of Babylon that there would be a time when they would come back to the promised land and my brothers and sisters I want to exhort you in 19, uh, 2023, I want to exhort you to hold on to God's word at all costs, at all costs, knowing that Jesus has promised us as, as a church that we will inherit a kingdom. Remember that Jesus came to, to, to establish a kingdom, that we would then inherit a kingdom in all its glory when he comes again. I remind you just of the final outcome of the word of God that came to Jeremiah when you go to the back, the last word, which is the book of Revelation from chapter 21 verses 3 to 4. This is the outcome. The heavenly Jerusalem, it says, will be our city and the dwelling of place of God will be with man. He will dwell with us and we will be his people and God himself will be our God. He will wipe away, thank goodness, every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. You need to be reminded that this is the future. This is the outcome. So very often we live in the present and we look very much with the present things in mind you need to know that that is not the final outcome and therefore you need to keep your eyes rooted in the word of God and so 
we note then um, that this promise in, in, that we quote so very easily in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse, uh, verse 3. And children, did you know that uh, we were taught in Sunday school that that's God's telephone number? Jer- Jeremiah 333. Call unto me. Huh, there's God's telephone number. Just remember that. Write it into your notes. I see you t- note taken. Okay, God's telephone number. Call unto me, and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. That's a wonderful verse to quote. But have you seen the incredible sadness that surrounds it? So we need hope in perilous times. And being a Baptist, I need some water. So, the message comes against the background of total darkness and with Jeremiah himself in prison again. I mean, you see how often God's servants are in prison. Here he is in prison. The light shines in the darkness. Says John, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jeremiah sits in prison. He sits in the darkness, but he's not overcome by his circumstances. Instead, he's overcome by the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And so the the particular promises of chapter 33 are, first of all, that the city of God will be rebuilt and re-established. Health and security will be restored. You see that in the first eight verses. I'm just going to give you a quick outline of of the text. We're not going to be able to go through that. It will focus only on the first three verses. So, first thing, the city of God shall be rebuilt, re-established. Health, prosperity, biblical prosperity and security will be restored. The first eight verses. Secondly, in verses 9 to 14, we learn that God will be glorified as His people rejoice in Him and as they praise His name. And every Sunday worship service is a mini reenactment of that hope that we are going to experience in a big, big way. And thirdly, there's an announcement in verses 15 to 26 that a righteous branch now that is an interesting title and I can't unpack it because it's not part of our thinking this morning but that righteous branch is the Messiah that's a messianic title he will rule he will rule Jesus will rule we've just celebrated him didn't we at Christmas Christ came into this world born uh, uh, to save sinners and to, to usher in and to Bring in that kingdom. So there you read um, about the righteous branch in chapter 33 and verse 15. In those days and that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. And we know of course that this is Jesus, the son of David. He's the mediator of the new covenant. And he is the one um, who will lead us into the Father's presence. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. So it's on Jesus' back that we travel. He's the way. He, he, the person of Jesus. That means you need to be attached to Jesus. You need to, you need to hold on to him. You need to travel, as it were, on his back. And he's the only way. So that's why in 2023, you must continue to cultivate a, a deep personal relationship with Jesus, that you know him. Not like the little rhyme that says, often when I pass a church, I drop in for a visit. So that when I'm carried in one day, the Lord won't ask, who is it? <laughs> so you, you, want to, you want to be attached to, to, to the Lord Jesus, that branch, the, the, the root of David. Okay. So what I'm saying to you, as you look at Jeremiah 23, Yes, it is a specific situation. Yes, the Babylonians are knocking at the door. Yes, they are, the, the Jews are about to be carried into, in, into, into Babylon. But I want you to see that chapter 33 goes far beyond the rest- restoration of the Jewish kingdom. It speaks to us today. History is actually repeating itself. Have you noticed that? And this is exactly what's happening here. That's why the scripture remains relevant. We learn from its history. 
And so in chapter 1, uh, chapter 33 and verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the God. The first word came to him, if you look back to chapter 32, verse 1, uh, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. The world and the church in particular, you, at the beginning of 2023, as you sometimes wonder what is happening. Why are things as they are? Why are things regressing? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time. The word of hope comes to, to Jeremiah and thus to the nation of Israel and I want you to notice that it comes in the midst of the darkest of political times. You think it's bad. You think it can't get any worse. Well, the word of the Lord comes. As the Babylonians are preparing to, to, to raise siege ramps, as it was common um, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the besiegement of, of, of cities in, in, in those times, the fortified cities in, in particular, uh, they prepare in siege ramps to sack Jerusalem. And this word of hope comes as Jeremiah is kept under God, as he's imprisoned by King Zedekiah, who thinks that, that, that Jeremiah is undermining his, his kingly authority, believing that the word of the false prophets more than the word of his true prophets. But by the way, the word of the false prophets, if you go back to verse uh, chapter 27 and verse 9, just to, to show you very quickly the word of the false prophets where, uh, where the people are encouraged, do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your fortune tellers, or your sorcerers who are, who are saying to you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. Yeah, that's what they were saying. Zedekiah was saying under the influence of the false prophets, listen guys, you're not going to go to Babylon. Jeremiah says, you're going to Babylon. You better go with God's, God's um, appointed word. Don't listen to these people. And again, I'm saying to you, what are we fighting against here in our society? Man, there are so many false prophets. I'm not only talking about spiritual prophets, I'm talking about secular prophets. And we, we tend to believe the secular prophets and the, and, and the religious prophets more than we believe the Word of God. And, and, and God is appealing to you, His people, listen to me. Listen. And you know, that's a phrase that you will find very often in Jeremiah. You do not listen you do not listen because you're looking with your eyes and you're looking with your senses, but you're not listening. You know how people can listen and not listen? And how often have you said to your sons or your daughters or to your spouse, you're not listening. You're not hearing me. The word of the Lord comes as a word of hope in the most hopeless of times. Zedekiah the king doesn't receive it, of course, he's not listening. But a wonderful thing is, and you're sitting here as a righteous woman and a righteous man, and you say, you know, who's listening? Well, God is listening. And the wonderful thing is that you need to learn from, from Jeremiah is that no imprisonment can deprive God's people of His presence. There, there are no locks, there are no chains that keep God from visiting His people where they are locked away. In fact, you know from the scriptures that God on numerous occasions has visited his people in prison in an extraordinary way. Just think of Joseph in an Egyptian prison. Genesis 39, verse 31 says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. God was with him in, 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 in that terrible circumstance. Think of Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel 6.23 says, No harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Or think about Paul and Silas in prison. Having had many blows inflicted upon them, and yet they were able to pray, yet they were able to sing hymns uh, to God in the night. You see that in Acts chapter 16. The, the presence of God was clearly with them. Many of Paul's epistles, the, the letters that we study and that we cherish, were written from prison. Why? The letter from, to the Philippians is the letter, the most joyful of his prison epistles. Is it possible to have, have, have joy in, in darkness? 
Yes. Yes, if God is with you, we will fear no ill. I want to remind you, my brothers and sisters, um, and there's a lot of suffering around. Uh, Carol, I'm just thinking about you guys in particular now. That God has used the lives and the words of His suffering people in very great ways. Look, I don't want to talk about myself, but I'm telling you the ministry brings about a lot of heartache and anguish. A lot. Can't throw out our toys out of the cot. We need to, as pastors, be ministering to you with all patience and perseverance and with love in our hearts, the love of the Lord Jesus. And because of that suffering that's not unique to pastors, but there is a suffering that's unique to pastors in the ministry, as we sometimes minister with tears to our people who will not listen. Uh, so I, I, I spent a lot of time in the company of dead men, books, biographies, and, and one man that I've really benefited from over the years uh, was Samuel Rutherford. Now he's lived from 1600 to 1661. He was a Scottish Presbyterian pastor, he was a theologian, he was an author. In his first years as a pastor in his parish church at Amberth in Scotland, he experienced very great, very great sadness. His wife was ill for a year and a month and then she died in their new home. Two of his children died um, during this period and yet he remained a faithful pastor. He was always praying, he was always preaching, he was always doing what he was called to do. He was always visiting the sick, he was always teaching his people from home to home. He was always writing, he was always studying, he was always enlarging his, his, his heart and his mind. And the thing that he was best known for is for preaching the God-centered gospel. That man was saturated with God. Um, as I said of John Bunyan, that Baptist who, who, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress in Prison, Suffering, produces wonderful literature. And they said when you pricked him, his blood was bubbling. Um, he was preaching a God-centered doctrine and, uh, and he insisted that Christian profession, and this is where the heartache comes in, that Christian profession should be matched by godly living. That's our job, to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian profession must be accompanied by godly living. God's people need to be urged and pleaded with to forsake sin and to become Christ-like. For goodness sake, that's what it means to be a Christian. You know? Um, and because of this, his church authorities, who were not godly men, chased him out of the church at Anworth. And then God used him in particular in his pastoral letters, which he said to his church members, particularly those that were suffering in his parish. They chased him away, but he had the pen. And he wrote notes of encouragement to his suffering parishioners. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon, whom you know, was a great Baptist preacher who himself um, was subject to severe suffering, not only mental uh, depression, uh, but he suffered in his body. He had great, in fact, he died at the age of 56, so he died 57. And he died of a broken heart, that's what they said. He died well before his time because of. The, just the burdens of the ministry. Well, Spur Spurgeon described Rutherford's letters as the nearest thing to inspiration which can be found in all the writings of mere men. And uh, when I was preparing the sermon, um, I read a, a sermon of Spurgeon on Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3, uh, which he entitled The Golden Chain of Prayer. And I saw there that he quoted Rutherford and he said, you're going to like this. Rutherford had a quaint saying that when he was cast into the cellars of affliction, you know what a cellar is? A cellar is a, a room that's down beneath the house, deep and dark and it's cool, and that's where people kept, um, you know, their, their rations, their food, and also their, their wines. Now listen to this here. Rutherford had a quaint saying that when he was cast into the cellars of affliction, he remembered that the great king always kept his wine there. 
and began to seek at once for the wine bottles to drink of the wines on the lees well refined. That's old language. Let me explain. What he wasn't saying, just for that you can take the pressure off now, if you're all in Baptist company here, um, what he wasn't saying is that in adverse circumstances get drunk. <laughs> That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is that even in the darkest times, when you're down in the cell of affliction, God has an encouragement for you when you find yourself in those dark cellars of life. You see, when God is at the end of your story, it matters very little what men can do or may do or what circumstances will do when God is at the end of your story. It matters very little what, what, what circumstances or men will do. Another biography, and I said, I, I've been in the company of this because of men like this and women like this because it helps me to get perspective, not never to feel sorry for myself because this is the ministry. We've been called to this. So stop complaining, but I need, I need the counsel, I need the help, I need the encouragement of others. So here's another biography that made a deep impression upon me, uh, John Payton. 1824 to 1907. He's another Scotsman who made, became a missionary to what was once known as the New Hebrides in the South Pacific Ocean. It's now known as the nation of Vanuatu. He arrived there in 1858. His decision uh, to go there was subject to severe criticism by a very respected elder in his church. The elder said, you will be eaten by cannibals. There, there, there were cannibals on those islands. They were eating each other. Um, you will be eaten by cannibals. John Payton responded, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave there to be eaten by worms. <laughs> I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. In the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. What I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters, as, I, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I'm asking you to stand where Jeremiah stands, the knowledge of the presence of God with you in your trials is your greatest comfort. And again, I want to say to you, it matters very little where you are as long as God is with you. I was reading in my quiet time this morning, Psalm 121, which I said to you this morning. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, who has made the heavens and the earth. He will not cause your foot to stumble. The, the maker of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. You see? That's the nature of the God. And in 2023, you must study the nature of God. And more than that, not study, you must believe Him. You must take Him into your hearts. That's one of the problems with God's people today. We keep God like in a medicine chest, medicine cabinet, and we use Him when we need to. Rather let Him be in you and with you. That's where His promised presence is. And so the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was imprisoned. And it came a second time to Jeremiah. Isn't it wonderful? He was in prison, we saw in chapter 32, but he came a second time. God did not forsake his, his servant there. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah again as a reinsurance. God knows how to encourage you. You know, Marcel and I were... We were very sick with COVID in 2021. We had that Delta virus, that dreaded Delta virus that, that got some of you. And John, you said you barely survived. By God's grace, you're here. Well, we were, we, were, we were close to that as well. But let me tell you, the one thing that I cherish about thinking about those times is the nearness of God at that time. The Lord was very near while we were in that prison. And... Uh, the experiential love that we experience from God, the word that came to us in such power um, will remain sweet to us. 
And so in verse 2, thus says the Lord who made the heaven and the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Look who's talking. Who's talking? Who's talking to Jeremiah? This is not, this is not a, 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 a counselor somewhere around the corner. Um, this, is, this is the Lord. He's talking. He's the one who's giving this promise. He's the one that it's inviting him and he's inviting us to call. No one less than the Lord of heaven and earth. And that's what we need. When our lives are turned upside down, when life, our lives are full of chaos and confusion, when, when truth lies slain in the streets and you wonder whether there will be tomorrow for the church, and when you, when you wonder whether the true church is still visible in the community, and, and when you see many of our leaders landing up in prison, yes, even, even in, in the Western world, pastors are going to prison now. For standing up against the nonsense that's been proclaimed in the public square. And I'm not going to go down that way now. You know what I'm talking about. We see pastors imprisoned. And here, this text is an assurance that the sovereign Lord is in, still in charge here. He's not forgotten Jeremiah. He's not forgotten the people of his covenant. The true children of Abraham. Which are of course comprised of both the Jews and believing Gentiles. That You know that, don't you? And you see how, how committed God is to His people and the firmness of His covenant. You see it in verses 19 to, to, to and following. Let me just read this to you again. 33, uh, verse 19. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that day and night will not come at that point in time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken cannot undo what I have done. You cannot undo the love that I have for you. I, I revel in those truths. I hope that you do too. I hope that you revel in the love of God. The faithfulness of God. Who, look who's talking here. Who's talking to Jeremiah? Who's talking to you? But God is talking to you as He is now. Hold on to Him. Hold on to Him. He cannot lie. He cannot. He cannot. Listen, your feelings and impressions of that which goes around you, that which you feel from day to day, which causes your highs and your lows. Listen, when you in the valley of doubt and darkness, take yourself to the Word of God and read it until light shines out again for your soul. Don't be abandoned to your emotions. They are fleeting and they're deceiving. I'm telling you. I'm telling you because I myself, I think I'm old enough now to say to you that I, I'm learning to master that problem. And it's when I spend time in the Word of God Letting the Word of God come to me prayerfully with humility, not, not supposing that I can um, do anything for myself. Looking to Him who is faithful. Light breaks forth. Hold on to Him. Don't be overawed by your feelings, your emotions. They're important. Yes, they're part of who you are, but remember you are a fallen man, you're a fallen woman. You cannot trust them, but you can trust God's Word. Jeremiah portrays deep emotions in this, in this chapter. He's not called the weeping prophet for nothing. But he's not overcome. And he says to the Lord a few hard things too. But he's talking to the Lord. And look who's talking to him. That's important. Who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? The word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40, by the way, I quoted Isaiah. Chapter 40, verse 6 to 8. And now finally, verse 3. Now, all this forms the basis of this great invitation for prayer. 
Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Now, Jeremiah has been praying a lot in this book. I don't have time to do this, but just if you go back to the 32nd chapter, just look very quickly. In verse 16, if you've got the, the English Standard Version, which I use, um, you will see from verse 16 to about verse 25, there is a prayer. He's always praying. Jeremiah is always talking to God. He's always, because that's what prayer is in the last analysis, is talking to God. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great things that you have not known. So he's just been talking to God in chapter 32 and now he must call upon God again. I just want to remind you of something that you may have forgotten. I remind you that prayer is an ongoing work. It's an ongoing work. It's part of the maintenance work that we need to be engaged in in this present season while we are waiting for our coming King. You've prayed about matters once and many times, but you must continue to pray. That's, that's, that's why Jesus teaches us two parables in Luke's Gospel. One is in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13, the parable of the, of the persistent friend at midnight, and then again Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, the parable of the persistent widow, where Jesus teaches us that we must always pray and never give up. So prayer is a work that you and I need to be engaged in in 2023, very specifically. God has promised us a certain restoration of all things. Yes. And we must always pray. Your kingdom come. But until that happens, we must also pray for our daily bread, our physical needs. We need to continue for the forgiveness of our sins, even as we forgive others, ongoing. And we must pray continually that we may not be led into temptation. And what has happened in Israel, I guarantee you what happened in Israel, they forgot. In fact, we know they didn't pray. They didn't use the temple for prayer. They went unto every high hill and uh, uh, under every tree and did their things there and worshipped the, the, the God of the nations. They forgot to pray. They thought, of course, they had God for good. But they forgot that they needed to maintain their purity and devotion to God. They forgot their God and they went to search in search of other schemes and look where it got them. They are now on the verge of exile. God's going to send them to Babylon. The question is, is there hope? Is there forgiveness? <laughs> well, we sang this morning, um, and this was an affirmation of the scripture, how merciful, how gracious God is to, to them and to us, despite their and our own hard-heartedness. And he's inviting us in this year of our Lord, 2023, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Call to him in the midst of the perplexities and the complexities and the uncertainties in the, in, in the face of political uncertainties, social uncertainties, medical uncertainties, economic instabilities, in the midst of poor commitments that you experience at all levels and from, from, from a church point of view, poor commitments to Christ, poor commitments to his word, God still says to me, to you call to me call to him call to him persistently pray without ceasing I want to remind you that the history of this church at least as far as I know it and Ivo knows it was this church was born in prayer there were people here converted by prayer we know that we, we, there was no evangelistic technique that we used God was there we had a pastor who was hard on us, Ivor. He called us three times a week from five to six in the morning to pray. To pray for the building that we obtained. How many of you remember Neville Branquina? Nobody remembers. Br Listen, there, there's a miracle. Yes, you remember Neville Branquina. Neville Branquina was, man, he was, I think, on a bottle of brandy a, a day, something like that. He chased our pastor away. With a, with, a, with, with, with a revolver when he came to visit 
godly Auntie Winnie, who was our church mother. People, I'm telling you, that man suffered with diabetes. He was on the, on the verge of death. The doctor came, uh, uh, said to Auntie Winnie, he's dying, you, you, you must say your goodbyes. He was in a coma in hospital. Well, what do you know? Our pastor and, uh, uh, and Auntie Winnie went and knelt next to his bed. He said, Lord, this man is about to enter a godless eternity. Give him one more chance. Give him one more chance. One of, one of this people from this congregation. One more chance. The Lord woke Uncle Neville up from the dead, literally. And when he was found, he was not lying in bed, he was sitting in his chair. I want Jesus. I want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my, as my Savior. Do you know that he was baptized with his diabetic feet, hardly moved, and from there, and from there on, now let us let shame us. From there on, he sat in that chair. I know it was the front of the chair. Morning and evening, he sat there listening to the pastor's sermon. And God gave him two more years, and he was our greatest encourager when we were trying to work on, on the, the old building that we had. Um, I'm just saying, there was the spirit of prayer that undergirded the ministry of this church in its early days that so deeply impressed me and never left me, that sense never left me of a persevering praying church. God says, if you call to me, I will answer you. God promises in Jeremiah that persistent prayer will find an answer and then he says, I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Dear friends, I want to ask you to take this text. This is God's word to you. Call to me, I will answer you. I will tell you great and hidden things that you've not known. Take him at his word. And go home, go into your prayer places, wherever you pray commonly. Shut the door, shut the door. Shut the world out, shut yourself in with Him, seek Him and try Him. Listen, if God is merciful and we know that He is, and if He is true, then He will be merciful to undeserving sinners such as we are. And if He is indeed for us, then you will not find a closed door at the end of your prayer. You won't find a closed door at the end of your prayer. Again, I want to say to you, Spurgeon says, God's own promises and character bind him to open mercy's gate to you who knock with all your heart. God help you, believing in Christ, to cry aloud unto God, and his answer of peace is always is, is ready, already on the way to meet you. You shall hear him say, Your sins, which are many, are all forgiven. My oh dear friends, the Lord bless you for his love's sake. Amen. Let's pray. Father, much has been said, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm praying that um, the, the words that were given to Jeremiah and to us this morning will ring true in our ears and fill us with hope, even um, in days of discomfort of many kinds. We, we pray as we look to you, like that persevering widow, like that persevering friend at midnight, as we look to you that we will see a continuing work here in and through the Walfus Bay Baptist Church to a needy, broken community that we will see men and women that are energized by faith in God through prayer because they look to Him, not to themselves, that we will see many, many turn away from the hopelessness of this world to the hope that is ours in Christ and which will in due course be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Amen.